So the first time I felt the true power of touch was a few hours after my first child was born. I was alone in an eerily quiet hospital room with my thoughts and my newborn when all of a sudden I was hit with a wave of sadness and an overwhelming feeling of loss. And I instinctively went to touch my numbed belly to see if my child was there. But of course he wasn't. He was safely tucked up in his little cot right next to me. But for nine months, I had used my hands to make myself feel more certain of this little being growing inside of me who I couldn't talk to and I couldn't see, but who I could feel wriggle and kick. There was a sharp elbow or a little bottom as if it was him trying to say, yes, mom, I really am here. Now, a mother of five, I need all the help I can get. And my kids are pretty sure I have eyes in the back of my head and a kind of spidey sense to know when disaster is about to strike. But the superpower I want to tell you about today is one that I use each and every day and that we all have right here at our fingertips, but that you might not even be aware of. And you wouldn't be the only ones. A recent YouGov poll of US respondents were asked which of their senses they would miss the most. And seven out of 10 said, unequivocally, that they would miss their sense of sight. The other senses barely even register with only 2% saying that they would miss their sense of touch. Now, as a neuroscientist, I can kind of understand that because you do have a very extensive set of brain regions that help you to understand a highly visual world. And you compare that to the little sliver to touch. But your skin is your largest organ. And your sense of touch is the first sense to develop in utero at around four to seven weeks of gestation. You use touch every single day to interact with objects, to communicate with each other. And yet seemingly we think that we wouldn't miss it nearly as much as seeing or hearing. And then the COVID pandemic hit. And I, like many others, realized how my feelings about touch were changing. I was setting up new working relationships purely through visual calls. No first handshakes. And my first grader had to go into that scary school building, trying to make new friends, trying to trust this teacher standing at the front of the class, all at a safe distance. So maybe, like me and my little first grader, you've been wondering, can you really live in a world without touch? And if not, what makes touch so special? I'm going to cut to the chase and tell you that what I think your superpower of touch does is that it allows you to trust and feel in touch with yourself and with others. Now this tactile fact checking that I did to check if my baby was still there, you've probably done that today as well. Did I lock the door? You go and reach out and try the handle. Or if I ask you now, do you have your mobile phone on you? I bet you, you put your hand in your pocket or your purse and you try to touch it and squeeze it tightly. So the idea here is that touch gives us a sense of reality. Yeah. It's something that helps us to feel sure when we feel unsure. And this is maybe best captured by the biblical story of the doubting Thomas. He's the apostle who, when confronted with the figure that he saw in front of him, he didn't believe that it was Jesus risen from the dead. Instead, as depicted here in this painting by Caravaggio, he had to lean forward and press his fingers into the open wound because he felt that his eyes were deceiving him. We've done this in our experiments as well. We've tried to make you feel uncertain about your perceptual experiences using an illusion that works equally well for touch and for vision. And what we found is that 
People, although are getting really good information through their eyes and do better at the task through vision, they're more likely to trust what they touch with their fingertips. Other research has shown that shoppers are more likely to feel good, to feel confident about their purchases if they've been able to touch test the items of clothing themselves. And this kind of begs the question how in the digital world, without touch, we can improve consumer experience. But you might say, these two types of fact-checking are quite different. Checking to see if your baby's there or trying to feel which shirt to buy. And you'd be right. But I use it to try and illustrate the fact that you do, in fact, have two senses of touch. And I want to prove it to you with a little experiment. So if you'd like, I'd like you to pick up your hand and look at it, front and back. Okay, and maybe you notice that the skin is a little bit different. This side, this smooth palm, is covered with an array of different receptors that allow us to understand things, how soft or hard, smooth or rough, hot or cold. But this hairy side, hairier on some people than others, is also populated with a set of effective touch receptors. And they tell us about our social world. And I want you to try and activate these receptors with me now, if you'd like. So I want you to close your eyes, and with your dominant index finger, I want you to mark out on the palm of your other hand a T-shape. And I want you to try and visualize that T. Can you see it in your mind's eye? How big is it? If you can't, just keep trying. Okay, now, let's try the other side of your hand, that hairy side of your hand. And what I want you to do is I want you to rub ever so gently from wrist to knuckle. Not too fast and not too slow, because these receptors that we only found about 30 years ago in humans are now known to be selectively sensitive to that optimal speed of stroking that mothers and fathers, partners and parents have used since time began to help us feel safe, to help us feel happy. How does that feel? Good? Great. So now you've activated these speedy object-sensitive receptors, and you've also activated these super-sensitive effective touch receptors. And if you did feel good, it's because by activating them, you're actually releasing some pretty powerful chemicals like serotonin and dopamine, which help you to de-stress and feel comforted and soothed. But beyond feeling good, like with that tactile fact-checking for things, we also know that this effective sense of touch helps you to feel connected and trust others. Now, that's certainly what I did with my little one after those first hard days in the hospital. I had to use touch stroking his little head while he was nursing or rubbing his belly when I changed him. And there's really good evidence to show that mothers suffering from postpartum depression can use touch as a powerful way to reconnect with their infants. Similarly, maybe after two years of isolation and physical distancing, you feel disconnected. Because whether it's work colleagues or family and friends far away, you've had to interact purely through visual calls. And maybe what you don't realize is even those inadvertent bumps on the way down the corridor as you pass each other were really powerful reminders that you're not alone. And our study during COVID showed that people who received the touch they wanted from the people they loved were protected against that loneliness that we heard so much about. And so this ability to feel connected is something that works without words and means that even strangers can really quickly feel comfortable with one another. It's why we do stretch out our hand and get a good handshake in. It's also why we have the so-called Midas effect where a server in a restaurant will be tipped much more generously if they make physical contact 
with their customers. So your sense of touch can help you feel and trust your connection with others. But did you know that it can also make you feel more certain about yourself? My youngest is hopefully playing happily outside or inside, picking up various things, which I'll undoubtedly have to pack somewhere. But if you were lucky enough to know her before she was very mobile, you might have found her lying on her back, happily stretching out a little pudgy arm, and then looking at her hand kind of intently. And then all of a sudden, you may have noticed her grab at something that seemingly wasn't even there. Well, the developmental psychologist, C. Stanley Hall, around the turn of the 20th century, described this important developmental milestone as the moment where the motor hand tried to grab at the hand that was seen. By grabbing for the hand with the hand, the two become one. And through this action, baby learns where their body starts and ends so that now she can successfully coordinate that little hand to pick up pebbles and flowers and even reach out and squeeze my hand if she gets scared. Now, a nice way of thinking about touch is that there is always a toucher and a thing that is being touched, the touchy. And in our little mini massage that we all had, you were both the toucher and the touchy. This is what is so special about self-touch because your brain interprets these two pieces of information to know that you are you. Research from depersonalization disorder. It's an, it affects people so that they feel that they're trapped outside of their body, removed from their sensory experiences and feelings. And it's highlighted the pivotal role that touch plays in building and maintaining your sense of self. And if you want to read more about it, there's a wonderful article in the publication Eon by a philosopher, Dr. Anna Chaunica, who writes of a particular depersonalization patient who says that she constantly has to touch objects and others to check and trust that she still exists. And it's this trusting through touch that I think makes touch so special. And it isn't a completely new idea. In the Enlightenment, the French philosopher Etienne de Condillac hinted at it with a pretty neat thought experiment. In it, he asks you to imagine a human-like statue. And then, one at a time, he gifts it one of the five senses. And he asks, how does this change the statue's experience of the world? And when he gifts the robot the sense of touch, he says that he finally has a direct relationship between himself and the world, which confirms the existence both of the self and others. And that is why now, more than ever, as you are swiftly whooshed into a digital world where you interact with others through virtual reality in Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse or simply through Zoom calls. We're trying to figure out how you will trust your experiences in this digital world without touch. You may have a Roomba zooming across your living room, avoiding walls and hopefully also your legs because we have gifted it the sense of sight. Your Alexa, for better or worse, is always listening. But now, in this futuristic context, we want to figure out whether we should gift our sense of touch to our robots. Consider the old age homes during the pandemic, where care robots arrived delivering medicine and food couldn't hug grandmothers and grandfathers who hadn't been touched for weeks or even maybe months. With exciting wearables and sensors, we're trying to figure out whether we should give the sense of touch like Condiac did to his statue so that we can feel more connected 
and trust more those with whom we interact in the digital realm. And those could be humans, but also artificial agents. But before I overwhelm you with thoughts of tomorrow, in this present time of disconnectedness and deep uncertainty, I want to ask you one final question. What do you want to do with your superpower of touch today? Thank you very much.